you know, a gallon of milk now compared to 10 years ago to 60 years ago, um, you know, is, is probably 60, 70 percent uh, smaller carbon footprint in that time frame, which is that's amazing progress as an industry. Welcome back to the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University, and today we're fortunate to have two guests from Cargill here with us. I want to introduce Dr. Kate Cowles, who's the North American Ruminant Innovation Lead for Cargill, and Josh Cushion, the Strategic Marketing Manager in the dairy space for the company. Welcome to both of you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Kate, I wonder if you would start with giving us a little bit of your background. I always find it interesting to learn, you know, who grew up in a farm, who didn't, how did you end up? kind of working in this space and end up in the position you're in now? Sure. I did not grow up on a farm, um, but my family farmed before I was born. Oh. I'm originally from Western Massachusetts. And if you've been there, um, there's not many farms left, com big commercial farms anyway. Um, but I grew up, we had a small hay business that my dad and I did together because he did grow up on a farm and um, I liked science and I liked horses and I liked cows. When I was an undergraduate at the university of Massachusetts, I had to decide which one I was going to pick. And I ended up doing an internship at minor in oh. upstate New York and decided that I wasn't going to pursue repro, but I preferred ruminant nutrition and the rest is history. Yeah. So I, I went to graduate school at uh, UNH in Illinois and then entered industry um, feeding cows. And um, the last couple of years, I switched back into more of a, my current position is a, is a blend of commercializing new things and R&D. So we're kind of in the middle. Our innovation team sits in the middle of, of classic R&D and launching to the market. Okay. So you started with Cargill as a, like a, a technical consultant, nutrition consultant? Correct. Okay. Yep. Field technical support. Um, and I also was a sales manager for five years. So oh. I had uh, both commercial experience and like straight traditional nutrition technical support role. Yeah. So you've had a big mix. That's cool. That probably comes yes, in handy. Um, it in does. Role. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. How about you, Josh? What's your path to your role right now? Yeah, for sure, Barry. I always tell people that I just kind of like cows and I like the people that tend to like cows. Um, and that's really as simple as it's been for my career path. So I grew up on a small um, farm in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, my dad had a dairy farm in uh, Lancaster County. Um, and I grew up doing 4-H and judging and all of the you know classic stuff there. I uh, went to Penn State and graduated from Penn State. And then 20 years ago, I moved to Wisconsin um, to start my career at Hordes Dairyman. Um, and I worked at Hordes Dairyman for about five years as one of the editors on staff there. Um, and then moved from that into different marketing, public relations, and storytelling roles, uh, working with companies like Zoetis, um, ironically, uh, Lana Lakes Purina Feed, um, and uh, Biotracking was another company I worked with. And then mm -hmm. the last 10 years, um, I've been working at Cargill, um, first in a dairy marketing communications role, and then have expanded uh, my responsibilities in that time now to to run um, the the basically the whole uh, marketing part of Cargill in the dairy space. Elevate bird well-being and improve profitability with Cargill's tailored nutrient solutions that deliver performance. Cargill is leading through applied nutrition, leveraging deep nutrient insights and understanding of the animal's nutrient requirements to achieve your production and performance goals. So I think probably almost everybody listening has heard of Cargill. It's one of the largest companies, in, at least in ag, in the world. Um, but can you guys give me some sense of the scope of Cargill Animal Nutrition, that piece of the overall business? Yeah, for sure. So Cargill Animal Nutrition is a global business. Uh, we've got about 20,000 employees um, that work in 40 different countries around the world. Um, and that animal nutrition is everything from your classic livestock species, um, our retail business, which work, operates in the pet, 
um, equine and backyard poultry space. Um, and then also um, we have a aquaculture business um, that operates in different parts of the world there. So, you know, our impact is pretty big. We, we pretty firmly believe that we touch the plate of about a billion people every day around the world, trying to provide them with, uh, you know, food for their families. That's incredible to think about it. A billion people. Yeah. 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 And like to the people's plates, right? Like that's, you know, hunger is such a big issue in other parts of the world. And I know that's not what we're here to talk about, but it makes you feel good yeah. about the work you do. Yeah, for sure. Kate, can you help me understand to support that size of business? Um, Obviously, we know R and D is is a piece of that. Maybe some of that is bringing new products to the market. Maybe some of it is getting better with current products. How how is that arranged? Or how how do you guys work through that? No, that's actually I like how you set that up because innovation to us um, is both. So mm-hmm. it doesn't mean everything has to be new. Sometimes we have an old ish technology that we found a new purpose for, and that also is innovation. Innovation is new ways of lots of doing lots of things. Right. Um, That said in our R and D group uh, within a and H or can um, is it, it, we do like Josh said, we touch all species. We are trying to focus on our core nutrition business, which is, you know, our main offer. Um, That said, we also are doing a lot of work in animal health now. um, And that would be, not in the traditional pharmaceutical sense, but um, in more of the quote unquote additive space. Yep. So they are complementary nutrition and health, obviously, I think they are. Um, so we do both types of things and that would be globally. So depending on the market and species that there's a, a, a wide range. So our capabilities internally have to reflect that. So our main, um, our main lab sits in Minnesota in Elk River, Minnesota but we have many satellite locations around the world. And also correspondingly, we have sites that can test um, at the animal level uh, around the world. So we can do bigger, more commercial size trials, especially in um, non-ruminants actually. So within the US and Canada, the North American, that's our business, Um, it's set up that way don't ask, but it's Canada and the, and the U.S. Um, our R&D is, I would say, a little heavier on the D. So okay. what can we take and go with that? Yeah. Gotcha. A lot to manage. A lot to <laughs> coordinate. That's it's exciting, though. So one of the things I know that's been a sort of a push across the entire company is sustainability. And that's kind of what we want to focus on in the conversation today. So I think it's good to start with, do you guys have a sort of a scripted definition that you use every day for when you're talking about sustainability? Because not everybody means the same thing, right? Yeah, for sure. So I I can start with how Cargill defines it, and then maybe um, Kate can kind of get specific into the dairy space. But I think if you look at sustainability as a whole, Cargill looks at it in three different components. Um, The first is climate change. Um, The second is land and water. And then the third is people, um, because if the people can't sustain themselves or the business, the the rest of that didn't matter. So, you know, our view on sustainability is really that this is both a a challenge as well as an opportunity um, for for our industry and and for our globe as we work towards producing food for a a growing population around the world. Um, and, And Cargill sees... Um, the opportunity um, really at its core to just do better with using less resources. So how can we be more efficient? How can we um, find ways to, you know, build resiliency um, into some of our agriculture um, systems while also improving um, the land and water around us? They're trying to find those win-wins, right? That's a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, we find those, you know, through collaboration. So, so we know that, you know, ultimately the farmer um, is the one that is going to be the steward of the land, right? They're going to be the stewards of the, of the water. And we see our role in this is, is to kind of do two things. One is to be a resource to those producers as they um, look at these opportunities, try to assess what makes sense for them economically, as well as for their operation. Um, and then the second thing is, is to be a connector. 
Um, Because I think one of the things that's unique about Cargill, some of the numbers I gave earlier, that's just animal nutrition. You know, Cargill is also in the food space. Cargill is also in, um, you know, different parts of our food system. Um, So we see an opportunity there as well to bring, let's say, dairy processors and dairy producers together in different ways, because that's that's a unique space that we operate um, in our food system. Okay, so I have to say this this is a very positive slant on the topic. And I typically think about it the same way, but you know, there there are plenty of dairy producers who here talk about greenhouse gas emissions and dairies, and um, I think reasonably say like this is just scapegoating. We're being thrown under the bus. The dairy EPA even says the dairy industry accounts for about what two percent of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Um, why are we under the microscope? How do you guys respond to that? You know, if this is a topic you're bringing up with a dairy producer, um, how we were, would respond is, or do respond is that we're not going to say that, you know, the, that ruminants are the main uh, issue for GHGs, but our consumers are interested in this, especially the the younger demographic of consumers are very interested in climate change in general and it's specifically on greenhouse gases. So we feel in the, in the, best interest of our customer and in our business, our customers are dairy producers. Um, we need to do work in the space and understand it. So we understand what we can and cannot do reasonably in a commercial operation. So there's some things we can do that are very expensive and can reduce greenhouse gases that are not economically viable. We know that, but what are the things we can do? And also that our people are even more importantly are already doing and have been doing. So that's one of our primary reasons for for being in this space. That's why we have so much confidence, to be honest, Barry, because we know that, you know, a gallon of milk now compared to 10 years ago to 60 years ago, um, you know, is is probably 60, 70 percent smaller carbon footprint in that time frame, which is that's amazing progress as an industry. Um, But we can't keep our planet healthy for the future without the involvement of farmers. Cause like I kind of said earlier, they're the ones that are really the stewards of these resources. Okay. So let, let's get into the details on that then. So if Cargill's trying to empower dairy producers say um, to not only uh, explain, get credit for, I guess the progress already made, but to make continued progress on sustainability what are some of the highlights of, of what you guys are bringing to the table to help that happen? Sure. So right now, um, what we can offer today would be our formulation system, Dairy Max. Uh, we have capabilities to reduce greenhouse gases, you know, reasonably within the, the footprint. And I don't mean carbon footprint, but like forage footprint, especially of what the, the farm has to work with. We can can do some of that right now, um, and so that's a that's a uh, tool we use every day. That's a it's our ration balancer um, with a with a sub model built into it around that. Longer term, we are planning on bringing um, maybe what people consider a little more traditional um, approaches to reducing methane likely in the form of an additive they are not um, on the market here in the in the u.s or in canada yet Um, furthermore a little more work we really feel strongly about is the lca approach the life cycle assessment approach which um, certainly like dmi is also promoting the nice thing about that is that it takes into account the whole operation up you know starting at the farm gate into the farm so those are some of the, the things we're working on um, and what we have today. Great. And just for anybody who doesn't know, DMI, Dairy Management Inc., would be the checkoff funded uh, innovation organization for the industry. Kate, one question about that. I don't mean to throw this out as a stumbling block, but I think to uh, monetize maybe some of these best practices in terms of getting paid for the reduction in carbon emissions uh, you know, requires some of these practices to be, I guess, vetted and, and 
validated in some kind of carbon market. Is that something that Cargill is working toward or how do you envision that happening in the next five, 10 years? Yeah, that's not a stumbling block. It's a great question. And it's on everybody's mind or many people's mind. We are working on that. I will be honest, not, it's not immediately what we have in the animal agriculture space, partially because it is a very gray area in animal ag. It just it is, is because, yeah. yep. however, we are working actively, in fact, trading um, in the offset market in other businesses. I will say, um, and this is my opinion, that I don't think the offsets are really where our business is going to go. The dairy beef business is going to go initially. It'll it'll lean toward the inset market. However, insetting, and also in my opinion, will require higher level of MRV. So what you just said, the measure re- report validate okay. space. Yep. It, MRV is like a big sustainability term. It's great to get to know because it's out there. Um, it's a really, really gray area. It's like we call it the wild west. I'm sure. I think I've heard that on your podcast before. But anyway, <laughs> um, it, it really is. But it comes down to auditing and, like, frankly, how rigorous is the science behind what we're saying or what anyone else is saying, and is it gonna pass the sniff test to hit someone's scope threes, scope three emissions, right? So we are we are spending a lot of time working on this um, right now, and I'm sure others are too. Gotcha. Yeah, it's tricky. It turns out it's kind of hard to measure a gas that's floating through the air. <laughs> well, you can't measure it, yeah, right? No, it's so it's next to impossible. So yeah. that's that's a good point. Commercially, commercially today, you can't. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's why, I mean, that's honestly why we've invested in the report in Max that Kate was talking about earlier. Like, if we can all agree here that we're not going to be able to measure this with any reliability, then we've just invested a lot of our resources into having what we believe is the best prediction engine of methane emissions and phosphorus and nitrogen in the industry. Um, Kate and team have gone through you know, several dozen 50 plus um, peer reviewed papers to to build that model up and to validate it. And that's why, you know, we're excited about having that tool available for our customers and for the industry as a whole, really. That's neat. So that's kind of the world I live in, but let, let me try to put my dairy producer hat on. And so Dairy Max is a model. So it's a set of a huge number of equations that's in a computer. And basically the idea is, correct me if I'm wrong, you put in a formulation with lots of details on each ingredient in there. And this model is now predicting methane released by a cow eating this diet each day. Is that right? That's right. It is based on a cow per day, exactly just how we make a diet, right? Yeah. I know we feed pens, but we do it on a, on an average cow or however you want to describe it. Couple it with your with the nutrients, and then we are making predictions based on that. And then we can also go backwards and back back calculate or back predict. Really, we can do it the other way around. We can say X, you know, grams of methane. How much? What would the diet look like? Oh, so I we see. can go. Yeah, we could do post diet. diet. Yep, we could do either way. So, that's and that's on methane. Josh mentioned FOS and N. Um, and is a little bit easier because we think about protein all the time. Um, well, I say easier. It's easier to, to manipulate in a model. There's a there's limits to nitrogen too, right? Um, and there is in phosphorus as well. Interesting. Well, that's I, there are very few tools out there, um, at least for field use, that you could take a diet and come up with a reasonably accurate estimate of the methane yield. So that's exciting. Um, well, I think another piece that's interesting to think about or, or find out more about what Cargill's doing is because of the scope of the company and because it's touch points in the retail sector uh, directly interacting with retailers, right? Cargill has kind of a unique opportunity to be sort of just that direct go between between ag producers, right, in the retailers. So how is Cargill writ large leveraging that role or that position to try to build collaborations? Yeah, I mean, we're getting this question all the time from our customers and in, in basically our food ingredients division, Barry. So like, 
that the people that work in that space, um, what I love about the team over there is they consider dairy one of the biggest opportunities we have at Cargill in the dairy food space because of the innovation happening in the industry and then also some of these opportunities and sustainability. Um, so what are we specifically doing? We're collaborating across those groups um, to connect with some of the larger dairy processors, and we all know who some of they are. Um, and the nice thing is they've been all very public about what their carbon emission uh, reduction goals are and the timelines by which they need to hit those. Um, so we, you know, we work with them to find solutions within their supply chain, like Kate mentioned earlier, because we believe that insets is probably um, the best path forward right now for us to have an impact. Um, and benefit both the producer as well as our industry as a whole um, is to focus on removing, um, removing car, de basically decarbonizing the dairy, the dairy supply chain. Thank you. Let me take a step aside for a second because sure. I wouldn't have known a lot of these terms a year ago. So um, <laughs> I think we should probably explain a couple of things. So scope yes. three emissions, we blew by five minutes ago, probably. Scope three emissions, correct me if I say it wrong, is um, companies that are trying to account for their impacts of what they're selling all the way back to the very original producer and the impacts of that. So if you're a Chick-fil-A, you know, you're trying to go back and think about the greenhouse gas impacts of poultry production, correct? Their supply chain. So right. what's in there, that, think of it that way, it's easier. But yes, what you said is correct versus like the, the immediate electricity they use. Right. So the supply chain. Usually this, the scope threes are the biggest part, the biggest, you know, contributor to the business. So. Right. And that, yeah, to your point, Chick-fil-A would also have to think about the greenhouse gas emissions with making the paper for the packaging, right? It's not just the yes. you know, everything, right? So, okay, so that then knowing that, and that's a lot of pressure from investors and, and other places for companies to reduce those big picture emissions, then one of the terms that people have come up with is insetting. Instead of offsetting and saying, I'm gonna pay somebody else to plant trees to compensate for my emissions, I'm actually going to try to reduce the emissions in my supply chain. That's called insetting, correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. They're making some kind of intervention or change. Correct. Yep. So for dairy producers, I mean, it's probably worth thinking about that if this is something you see your business going into. In theory, Delta Airlines may buy carbon credits from you if you are doing no-till, whatever, you know, trying to sequester carbon in your soil, but also you may have some way of working together with somebody in your direct supply chain that you're providing to uh, okay. Dairy Queen for, you know, whatever, sure. um, where they may actually be helping you achieve some of those goals for their supply chain. That's right. Yeah. If I'm a dairy producer on this one right now, Barry, I think I'm I want to understand, like, be very active with my who's buying my milk probably a co-op, right? But if you're if you're selling direct in that way either and really understand where's my milk going and then what are the climate goals that the company using that milk is trying to achieve? Um, because I can tell you from the conversations we've had, these companies are, they're hungry for ways to saw, to reduce emissions in the dairy supply chain because um, it's hard to do. And the reason it's hard to do is we've, become, we've done so much work on the front end already to become so efficient and good stewards of resources yeah. that finding even more is really hard to do. But if you're a dairy producer out there that, that has ideas or wants to try to see if this is an opportunity for your business, um, I think making sure you know who your milk buyer is and then specifically where your milk goes is the best opportunity that we could recommend. Okay, that, that's a good takeaway. Here, here's another question that uh, I know a lot of people would ask. So, and I, I would say this exactly the same if I ran a dairy farm. It's like every year they come out with more rules and um, most years the price doesn't go up or it goes down, right? So it's like, how do, how do I make this work? Um, the offset market, it's maybe easier to see how that works if you can get enough money for a ton of carbon to pay for whatever practice is being proposed and there's actually a viable market exchanging that you know those carbon rights you could see how that might work if the price was right what about insetting so if that's the more likely route is there money being exchanged from an end user to a producer to compensate for a 
more sustainable product or how do you see that happening today? So today, at least from Cargill standpoint, we are not, um, we're kind of in the middle of that right. transaction, what you just said. So we are not, we are not minting an asset, which is uh, at this point in the animal ag space. Um, but the money part, like what you just mentioned, that is, I think in our industry, um, we'll see how that evolves, but at some point there has to be money exchange somewhere else no one's going to make an intervention that costs money and they first of all if they lose production no way right yeah um i would guess and then if it's just flat well i mean what's in it for me so like that the money piece has to be delineated whether it's and the offset market you're right is clear it's just not high enough right so like it had a ton has to be worth more maybe it will be i don't know but the insetting part um that the the money flow, the finances have to be clearer than they are today in animal agriculture and agronomy. It's a little bit clearer. Okay, that's a good answer. So, and of course, none of this is to set aside the concept that if you feed a diet that's more efficient, you're going to win both economically and for the environment, right? Like, and I preach this be. all the time, right? So, yes. Um, yep. So th- there's definitely those things out there. Um, I think. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. One thing I would add to that is the, we didn't touch on this, but like you said, more efficient and better for the environment is super important. When when you look at methane on an intensity basis, I think we're already there. The problem becomes on a, on a gross amount basis. And so far we haven't been told stop doing this, but that remains an unknown as far as I'm concerned. This is maybe getting too far out in the corner, but we, we have a growing number of farms there there's not a huge number because they're all large farms but a growing number of farms with digesters how much are you guys in the animal nutrition space already thinking about what should we be doing with the diet to minimize enteric methane coming out of the cow's mouth but let lots of it be produced in the digester well that's a great question and we do get asked that a lot um and i'm glad you delineated between the two because if we want to make more in the digester then we're probably going to make more coming out of the front end and back end so it's a balance uh we are working actually in this space we don't have anything ready to come to market yet but this is a question our customers ask especially those that are have a digester access to one so um it is related. I will say that. Are we balancing a diet to do that right now? Not today. That's a tricky question. It is. It is. Yeah. You got like two goals opposing each other. So yes. yeah, it's Correct. a tricky proposition. So I think mm-hmm. um, you should be working with a nutritionist that can help you navigate that for sure. And where the value is yeah. on one versus the other. Not to get in the weeds, but it does make me feel a little bit better about, I think in the last 50 years, we've gotten more productivity in part with high passage rate, which you start to lose digestibility. But if you have a digester back there making energy, that's maybe okay. That's actually great. Yeah. <laughs> so high passage rate, that's the answer. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. I got on my little nerd hat there for a minute. Um, <laughs> so to tie, tie this up, kind of the big picture topic. So if you're talking to a dairy producer today, and they're saying, well, what should I be doing 2024 to prepare myself for the way the industry is moving in this space? What's the best use of my time? What should I not jump into because it's not ready yet? Well, how do you guys answer that? What I would say from a practical standpoint is get your data in a format and a methodology that you understand how to control it. Your cow data your forage data, your energy usage, your tra- all of it. Start to get your head around where is it and how do I access it and how can I, if I have to, share it. That's a practical thing I would, if I were milking cows today, I would start to think about if you haven't already. That's really yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah, I would agree because this whole thing is built, is basically a data economy at the moment, right? And it's all based on improvement from where you are right now. Yep. So without an baseline. ability to say where you're at right now, the baseline, right? You have no ability to demonstrate improvement and thus get compensated for it. So I think what Kate said there is spot on. 
That brings up another yeah. frustrating point in this space. Uh, sorry, uh, and you guys can fill in more on that if you want. But also, how do you how do you respond to people who are like, well, you know, I've been uh, no tilling for a decade. I've been feeding the best diets I could my whole life. Now all of a sudden, all that matters is change. So should I take five years and do everything horribly? So I can you know, so I can show improvement. How, how do you, is there anybody sort of at the retail end working, recognizing that and working to make this sort of more just, I guess? I think depending on the, the, um, the re whatever, who's, who's, who's interested in this and these, in the interventions, right? I think that the baseline part, like Josh said, is still unclear. That's why the LCA, the life cycle assessment work is very important because I believe, Barry, that what we might see is look backs. So we're going to be able to look back five years. I don't know what it is. I don't know the number. Mm -hmm. um, and that will prevent some of the stuff, what you just said of like, uh, oh, I'm just going to go dig up a field. And because we don't want, nobody wants that. That's right. and like, we're not going to go feed cows 10 pounds of straw and then say, oh, look, you know, like that's not the goal. But I don't really, I don't think anybody really knows how that's going to go because it is so new, but it's a very, very good question. Well, I wasn't going to go easy on you guys. I had to throw all the hard ones at you because I don't yeah, have for sure. all these. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think we are either, right? Yeah. Like we're learning in this space with everyone else. It's the other reason we've partnered with University of Idaho, with Cornell, and made some investments there in some of the projects that they're doing to explore the methane space, specifically the methane chamber at, at Cornell, I think is a pretty cool project. So, you know, we want to be right there with the rest of the industry trying to figure this out because i think one of the things that sets cargill apart from some of our other competitors is that, that we're invested in the industry um you know we spend you know both of those were half million dollar investments um so we try to put you know use the the money that our our customers you know share with us for their feed bill use that and put it back into their industry and that's something that's important to us and this is a space we need to do it in right now absolutely it's time for our famous three. Ivonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Ivonic's focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. Okay, great conversation. This is interesting. I'm sure I could go on all day, but I'm not allowed to, so <laughs> we've all got things to do. So we've got three questions we throw at everybody. Uh, I'm going to bounce these back and forth to you guys. It's fun to see what people say. So Kate, first question for you. What's your favorite dairy-related book or resource? Uh, you're going to appreciate this one, but really a favorite in our house, because my husband's also a nutritionist, is The Nutritional Ecology of the Ruminant. If you want to learn about methane and you also need to go to sleep, it's a great book. It is an <laughs> unbelievable book. Um, it's a classic text, but it's one of my favorites, honestly. Yeah, that's cool. All right, Josh, what about your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture? Yeah, for sure. I got to give a plug to Hordes on that last question since that was my first job. But um, I think the best book that I've read in the last few years, Barry, is Atomic Habits. Um, it's maybe one of the best personal development books that that I've ever read, maybe has been written. But just the practicality of that is is so important. And it, the thing that I nerd out on is morning routines. So like just the way that you can like build a morning routine to set your day up for success is why I like it so much. Don't tell me you ran five miles this morning. I didn't this morning, but um, I did get a few miles in yesterday. <laughs> Good for you. Well, that book's one of about 50 sitting around our house to be read. So maybe I'll have to move All it right, up. Yeah, up that one up on the top of the pile. Okay. All right. I'm going to throw this at both of you. It's, this is really neat to see how people answer this. So what do you think sets a successful dairy professional apart from someone who's maybe not quite so successful? Be willing to accept and grow with change. I, it, and I don't, it probably doesn't matter what you do, but it is 
we are seeing much more rapid change than we have in the past. And I don't think it's going to slow down. Yeah, I'm thinking the exact same thing, Kate. Like the word that came to mind to me was curiosity. Um, and I mean, growth mindset is probably the fancy term for that, right? But like, are you curious about how things are changing, why they're changing and what opportunities that creates for you? Because Kate's right, it's going to continue to change how you face that reality as it is and then, and then change with it in a way that's advantageous to you, I think requires a lot of curiosity. Good answers. That fits well with the topic today, right? Lots of unknowns, and um, but you're not going to win if you just gripe about it. <laughs> yeah. And look for the opportunity. Great. Yeah. Well, Josh, Kate, I've greatly enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for being part of the podcast today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, have a great day. Okay, well, this is, again, Barry Bradford signing off uh, another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to hit that button. We'll see you next time.